thanks for tuning in to New Life Sermon Series Online. If you're blessed by these messages and are interested in helping spread the Word of God to others, make an investment today. You can give at newlifechurchsf.org. If you have a story or a testimony to share, let us know on our website as well. We hope you have a blessed day and enjoy today's message by Pastor Alex. Are you guys ready for the Word of God? All right. I want to tell you a story I heard. It was about an airplane that was about to crash. This airplane had four very important people on board. Okay? But the problem was they only had three parachutes. So the first person who was flying, this very important person, says, I am a brain surgeon. People need me. I can save many lives. So he takes that first parachute and jumps off. The second guy says, I'm a very important person. I'm a NASA scientist and engineer. I'm very important. My country needs me. My, um, my government needs me. Science needs me. So he grabs uh, this backpack and jumps off the plane. The third person on the plane is Billy Graham. He looks at a kid who is 10-year-old Boy Scout and says, Listen, I lived a good life. I'm old. I'm frail. I'm okay to meet my master. Why don't you take my parachute and jump? The boy said, Sir, we have two parachutes left. See, the smartest man alive just jumped out with my backpack. Last week, I promised that we were ending the series, Grace Beyond Karma. However, today's message might sound like I'm not ending the series. I'm going to talk about grace a little bit more. And uh, I promise after Dr. James 10, we'll start a new series. It was just not cool for me to start a new series today and then stop preaching next week. You know, and then, yeah, you'll forget it all. All right, and so today I want us to open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. In this story, we see a picture of God's grace and uh, what it makes us do and what it does for us. In this story, you will see yourself and you will see God and how God responds to us people. Are you ready to read? Okay. One day, David asked, Is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, let's stop here a second. Who is Saul? Saul is first king of Israel. David is the second king of Israel. Saul hated David. Would, some of you know this story. Actually, he hated him so much, he was jealous of him. He was suspicious of King David so much that he dedicated up to 15 years of his life to chase David through the desert with an army. David lived on the run, national hero. David was a national hero. He killed the Goliath, and now he's running away, for, running for his life. Imagine this. This is not a police, Sioux Falls Police Department chasing you. This is FBI. Sioux Falls Police Department is limited to Sioux Falls. But FBI is a nationwide organization. And so Saul employs his spies. He employs special forces. Actually, the Bible says he takes 3,000 of the best soldiers. This is not just somebody just going through boot camp. He's getting the best soldiers around, and he is putting everything to make sure he's going to kill this young kid named David. David was a teenager. Wow. See, in our culture, teenagers are stupid still. That's what we think of them. Fear, right? Like, they don't think about these kind of things. They want to play video games. In that culture, notice that David already is in the army 
fighting Goliath. Now, I probably offended somebody. I just dug myself in a hole. I didn't mean the word stupid. I meant the word um, young and irresponsible yet. That's what I meant. Thank you. Unexperienced, irresponsible. Uh, you know, their head is still not in it. And David is already, thank you, Lord. I just caught myself. <laughs> Too late, but still. <laughs> and so Saul is running, chasing a kid named David. David gathers a small army of people up to 600. And I'm thinking, how? 20-year-old David, 21-year-old, an army already? This guy was gifted. See, it's not the age. It's the gift. It's the gift. And so, what would you do with, if you would become a king? What would you do to the family who were persecuting you for 15 years of your life? You know what they did in those days? They would kill everybody from a previous administration. Everybody. That was the norm because they didn't want for rebellion to rise up. And then the people would naturally put into leadership or rulership a family of somebody who is a king. And so... There's this guy, crippled guy, he's hiding. He's living in hiding because he doesn't know what King David will do. Now King David is on the throne. And so he asks, watch what he says. Is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? See, we, we have been brainwashed to live with with I've been hurt people have been against me I had a hard childhood and I see a lot of us live with that when are you gonna when are you gonna heal when are you gonna heal and move on because until you are healed you cannot do what King David is about to do next verse number two so he summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them or grace. I want to show them grace. See, people who have received grace... People who got the revelation of grace, give grace. Mean people are probably still under the law. Mean people are still condemned in themselves. They're still condemning themselves. And that's why they can't give you grace. They don't have any. But at this point in his life, David received something. Here's how I know. Because he said sacrificing and offering you didn't want God he realized that the law and the system of law is not good enough he said you want my heart I would give you all the bulls and sheep and sacrifices and goats that you want but that's not what you want God you want me you want my heart what did David experience that he said that Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's son is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodebar. Lo. You know what the meaning of Lodebar is in Hebrew? No place. Where is he? No place. It's like saying he lives in a slum. He doesn't have a house. For example, if you ask somebody who maybe is homeless, who say, where do you stay? No place. What do you mean? Don't you have a place to live? Don't you live in a, in a, in a mission or Dudley's house or whatever? That's not my place. Yeah, I have a place to sleep, but I don't live there. I live in no place. That's where 
the royal grandson of King Saul, the first king of Israel, was living in no place. Nowhere. Where is he? The king asked in loaded bar. Ziba told him, at the home of Makir, son of Emiel. So he doesn't even have his own house. He is living as a beggar, as a guest in somebody else's house. Somebody's having pity on him. Next verse. So David sent for him and brought him from Makir's home. His name was Mephibosheth. I've been practicing that name for a long time. And it says, and there's many more of that. So let's call him Matt. Okay, let's call him Matt. His name was Mephibosheth, Matt. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground. Remember, he's crippled, so it takes him effort to... Maybe they carried him, and he bowed low to the ground... Uh, in deep respect David said greetings Mephibosheth greetings Matt again Mephibosheth replied I am your servant and look what David says don't be afraid why does David says that because in those days if the king, new king discovered that an old king's relatives is still alive, it would be death. So Mephibosheth is shaking because he's thinking, this is it. Me, my son, we're gone. Finally, king found us. My family was mean to King David. My grandpa has done a lot of wrong to King David, and now I am going to repay. He's going to repay me. But that's not how God looks at it and how David looks at it. Don't be afraid, said David. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property. Watch this. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather's soul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Wow. There's a spiritual symbol here. Next. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. Unfrozen funds, you know. Government sometimes freezes funds. <laughs> David unfroze everything. That's awesome. And you and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him to produce food and your master's uh, for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 sons. I don't know how many daughters, but 15 sons and 20 servants. Last verse. Ziba replied, Yes, my lord, the king, I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table. It says daily in some translations. Daily and daily David's table like one of the king's own sons. How many of you know that kings do not eat alone? Here's why politicians eat alone. Because they need to be reelected. Kings do not need to be reelected. That's a position for life. And so guess what kings do? They invite people to eat at their table. Now, what does this story have to do with grace? Everything. See, in this series, Grace Beyond Karma, we have discovered that as a believers, we are not or no longer under the law. We have died to the law right and so we are freed from the law see under the law it's pretty simple it tells me 
whenever I do something wrong. For example, being a Christian for a long time, I felt constant condemnation. Not because of a sin I committed, but guess why? I felt condemnation because I didn't read enough Bible. Who condemned me? The law. I felt condemnation that I didn't pray enough. Who condemned me? The law. Yes, I had other sins, of course, and the law was definitely telling me that I was wrong. And I was constantly living under this guilt. If you're a Christian and you are living constantly in this guilt mode, you wake up with guilt, you go to bed with guilt, you have not understood the grace of God yet. And so I pray today that you will receive the revelation of grace. Because you can't just understand, you can't just hear about it, you have to understand that. It has to become a revelation of grace. And it's such a freeing feeling when you wake up in the morning and you read 15 verses or you read one verse and you don't feel guilty all day. Some of us who grew up in late 90s or 2000s, maybe we read books like by people who said they would pray for four or five hours a day. And we thought in order for us to be spiritual, we need to pray four to five hours a day. Some people, I read a book by one guy. He said he, he quit his job and started praying eight hours a day like a job. And I was feeling so guilty. I was constantly feeling under this condemnation. And when God helped me understand grace, now I'm totally different. Whenever I feel condemnation because I didn't do something good enough, I prayed one minute less today than yesterday. Guess what I say? Law, I'm not under you. You have no power over me. Don't forget who you are and who I am. You are my servant. Don't forget who I am. A child of God. He made us kings and priests unto God. Don't forget who I am. See, the law is not there to control you, dictate to you, command to you. It's there to show you something and I'll tell you what. But it's never to bring condemnation. And here's why we have people, churches full of religious people. And here's why church people really don't like Jesus. Honestly. Because he drank with sinners. He forgave prostitutes. A woman caught in adultery says, I don't condemn you. He ate with sinners. Come on. Oh, that drives religious people crazy. They don't like that kind of a Jesus. They pick Jesus when he whips people. That happened once. <laughs> that happened, and guess who he whipped? Religious people. <laughs> Making money. <laughs> you got to get a revelation of grace. It will set you free. Some people say, well, if I live under grace, now no longer under the law, who is going to tell me how to live? Who is going to tell me? How do I know how to live by grace? Now that I won't be condemned. Check your life, people. Where are you getting condemned every morning? Where are you getting condemned every night? What tape is always telling you you're not good enough? You're so bad. You're, you're just a piece of... Uh, <laughs> Where is it? That's not, that's not God. That's the law telling you. You are friends with the law, but you're not under the law. But how do you live by grace? And I wanted to show you something. But let's go. I got four points, and I got 13 minutes. Four points, 13 minutes. Let's go quickly into this. Point number one, grace seeks people it can show kindness to. One day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? 
You know why it's written in the Bible? Because these are the words that God is saying to you today. He's saying, I'm seeking my children who I can bless, who I can show favor to or kindness to or grace to. Why is David doing it? Because God has shown him so much grace and now he's overflowing with grace and he wants to show grace to his enemies even. Imagine waking up. Do you usually, when you wake up, say, who can I show kindness to today? What is our prayers? Don't raise your hands. But what is our prayers like when we wake up? God bless me. My family, my business, my job, my boss so he can give me more money. Me, 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 me. Bless me on the road. Usually people, we don't wake up thinking, who can I bless today? But here's what grace does. And you'll begin to see this after this series in your life. You'll begin to see waking up and saying, how can I bless somebody else? Now, if I force you to bless somebody else, that's the law. But if you... Do it from your own heart. If you do it from a position that God has been so good to me, how can I do something as good for others? That's grace. Some of you are like, I don't have much. It's not about how much you have. It could be a hug. Waking up, it could be ladies, uh, your shoes that don't fit you, or pants. Those pants are never going to fit you. Or they're going out of style. Let me just say that. I'm just offending everybody today. Teenagers, women. <laughs> Walking home, yeah. I drove my own truck. <laughs> I'm good. Grace wants to give. How do you live on grace? Because now you're not in condemnation. You're not thinking, oh, God, forgive me. Because... Under grace, the Bible says we have no longer consciousness of sin. So we live from, I'm accepted. Now I want to bless somebody else. So what does grace of God does? Look at people who are full of grace. They always seek to bless others. God said, I will bless you and make you a blessing. So grace, how do you know a person is full of grace? Because they've accepted something from God and now they're giving it away do you know that Jesus said for I have come to seek and save that which was lost he didn't say for God did not come to this world to condemn this world but to save it do you know that Jesus said that he would leave the 99 saved one and go and find the lost one he will seek the lost one Lost means in sin. Lost in death. And he would go. He doesn't wait for them to get good. He goes and finds them. That's why as a church, our vision here is to bring people closer to Jesus. But that means we've got to go and find lost people. Some of people say, Pastor, they'll never come to church. They're too lost. I'm like, what? That's perfect. Lost people are the best to bring to Jesus. Amen. And usually, it's not the church people that bring new people to church. It's the people who were lost and just got found. When somebody just gets found, what do they do? They tell everybody. They're the best evangelists. It's, it's not the, the, the best evangelists are people who were lost and now are found. But grace seeks. How can I show kindness? Number two. Grace requires right self-assessment. Verse 8, let's put that on the screen. Look what Mephibosheth says. He says in the middle of the verse, he says, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Talk about high self-esteem. <laughs> Super confident kid right there, Mephibosheth. He's calling himself a dog. Why is he doing that? Can I present to you the idea that the reason he's calling himself a dog because he feels like one. He feels like a dead dog. He can't farm. 
No wheelchairs in those days. No ramps. <laughs> There's big steps. Remember, he's royal blood and he's hiding in Lodabar. What kind of state of mind is he having at this point? Usually hurt people are mad people. Who is he mad at? Saul, yeah, that's one option. Who else? Himself? Maybe. Are we usually mad at ourselves? Do we usually blame ourselves for our problems? Who do we blame? God, yes, but God is so far up, uh, you know, we usually find somebody closest. And that's David. If it wasn't for David, my father would have been a king. And you know how he crippled his legs? Bible tells us later. His nanny found out that Saul and Jonathan died. And she wanted to hide Mephibosheth from King David who was going to kill and execute the whole royal family because that's what they did and as she was running she dropped him and he crippled his legs and nobody ever set him back the right way so he's blaming David he's blaming God he's living in hatred he's living with revenge in mind and here this king is inviting him and he thinks that's it. I'm a dead dog. That's why he called himself a dead dog because he really felt dead. He said, this is it. I'm dead. I met the king. And when king invites him in, Matt, I can't, I can't pronounce his name. I have to think about pronouncing his name. When Cain invites him in, he goes in. Let me just give you two types of self-assessment. And see, test yourself. How do you assess yourself? How do you think of yourself? There's a right way and a wrong way to think of yourself, according to grace. The first way, I think what... Matt is saying is that I don't deserve it. I'm a dead dog. I probably cursed you, King. Not once. Maybe I lived my whole life cursing you. And now you're inviting me to eat at your table. I'm not worthy. But yet, what does he do? He goes in and eats at the table of King David for the rest of his life. And then there's a second group of people. They say, I'm not worthy. And I'm not going to go in until I am. A while back, we were walking out of the church late at night. And one of uh, my old acquaintances drove by the church on his motorcycle. He stopped and I said, every time I see you, it's by the church. I think it's a hint. He's like, no, I'm not coming to church. <laughs> you know. And we started talking to him. And uh, he said, you know what? If God even invited me to heaven, I would say, no, I'm not worthy. I'm not going to go in. I'm not worthy. Actually, he said, if there is hell, I would tell God to put me in the worst part of hell. True story. Why was he saying that? Because he was feeling that he was a sinner. See, there's two responses. I'm a dead dog. Both guys were saying, I'm a, bad, I'm a dead dog. But one goes in and accepts the kindness of God. And the other one says, no, 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 no. I got to work for it. And if I'm ever right, and if I ever is made perfect with God, then I'll go in. And God says, no, you will never. If you're the second guy, you will never go in into my rest. How do you? See, it's, a, it's, it's totally normal for us under grace to do a self-examination who we are. But we shouldn't stop our self-examination to allow us to eat at the table of the king. See, a lot of you, the reason you're not walking in and to, in the inheritance that God has for you right now is because you're, I'm not worthy. I need one more year and maybe I'll get better and then God can use me. No, God is not going to wait till you get perfect because you'll never get perfect. 
He wants to use you right now. He says, I am talking to a dead dog. Come on in. I'll make you alive. Come on in. I'll make you alive. Many of you are stopping what God is trying to do in your life. Because you're saying, I just need more time. And it's never going to be the right time. Today is your day. Listen to me. And I feel like telling you from the Spirit of God that today is the day God says, come on in. Sit at the table. I'm not waiting for you to, to you know, do 10 Hail Marys and to do so many prayers before you can come and sit at my table. Now is the time. Now is the time. That's what God is saying to you today. Grace. What will grace do in your life? It will return your inheritance. Write this down. Point number two. Grace will return your inheritance. Look at number, verse number seven. King David says, I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather's soul. And you will eat with me here at the table. Grace of God will begin to restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Maybe you wasted 10 years in drug addiction. And today you're living with guilt. And you're saying, I cannot start anew because I have this past behind me. Listen to what David does. And David is a symbol of God. And Mephibosheth is a symbol of us. Crippled, living in nowhere. Listen to what grace does. Grace will restore to you what the devil has stolen. Let me, let me step back a little bit. How many of you know that when God created you, you were made in the image of God, and you, you had a purpose, you had an inheritance. When you were born, sin stole your inheritance. For many of us, right? The devil stole that inheritance, and now we're living as a broke beggars. But the truth is, inheritance of God is still yours. So yes, maybe you wasted five years on drug addiction. But when you come and get a revelation of grace, God begins to restore. Listen to me. I've been a pastor for almost 15 years now, or maybe a little more. I have seen people come broke in every area. Mentally, physically, financially emotionally every area and i have seen how god under his grace begins to restore i've never seen a person come one way and god just kept them that way sometimes i see people come with gray faces they don't see it but they're so broken they're so hurt there's grayness upon their faces you can see a countenance and after a couple of months walking with God, and if they are, they, they really start believing what God has for them, everything changes and their face changes. They looked, they looked at people suspiciously. Now they trust more. They were, were always like, I can't believe these people don't love me. Now they hug and love people. I've seen people who come broke. I have seen people who have had nothing. And as they're walking in God and this grace, God begins to restore to them. Bible says God will restore to you what the devil stole. But here's proof that God has an inheritance for you. This is what the Bible says. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. A good man is God a good God. Then he has an inheritance for you. And here's two things with your inheritance. Either it's been stolen and the devil has to return it. Or... It's been growing, over, overgrown with weeds. And God has to pull some of those out. Amen? Amen. But God has an inheritance for you. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. It says, uh, uh, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received, received the inheritance from God. For He chose us in advance. And he takes, he makes everything work out according to his plan. So God, you were born because there was a plan. You weren't just born by an accident. You were born because of plan. And you were born with inheritance. Because a good man leaves 
inheritance for his children's children. And God is a good God, so he wouldn't just bring you here and say, here, live in poverty. No, I have an inheritance for you. Now, for some people, inheritance is, you could use more money because you can't pay your bills. But for others, it's joy. You can pay all your bills. <laughs> but you're just mean and ugly and depressed person. You don't need money. Some of you here do not need more money. It would be nice, but you don't need it. You need something else. And God says, I have it for you. And what grace of God will begin to do is restore to you the inheritance. Just like King Saul says, I will give you all the lands. They are yours. Notice he doesn't give you somebody else's. He gives you what is rightfully yours. And for somebody, it's, it's a big business. For somebody, it's a good job. It's different for everybody. But God will give you back what is yours. You got to get a revelation of this. But I'm a dead dog. I don't deserve it. It's not about what you deserve. It's about who I am, says God. It's not about what you deserve or how good you are. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But it's who he is. I want to show grace. I want to show kindness to you, says God. Listen, these words are not from Mephibosheth. These words of God are for you and for me. Wants to show you kindness. Why are you rejecting? If God even would open the gates of heaven, I would not go in because I don't deserve it. I'm a dead dog. The only thing that's going to stop you from inheritance of God is you. It's never God. The only thing that's going to stop you from blessings of God is not God. I'm waiting on God, Pastor. No, you're not. God is waiting on you. I feel my breakthrough coming, Pastor. I'm just waiting on God. No, God is waiting on you. You just need to read that one book in the lobby right there. Don't want to buy it? Take it. Read it in the cafe. Put it back. One chapter a week. After service or come early. Read a chapter. Put the book back. I don't care. I'm waiting on God. No, God is waiting on us, Bible says. God is waiting on us. So grace seeks to show kindness. God is seeking you to show you kindness. Grace returns your inheritance. That's what's going to happen when you jump in into this pool of grace. As long as you're just doing your toes like this, it's not, not going to work. But if you jump in, God will begin to restore your marriage. God will re restore your business. God will restore your mind. And God will restore your broken uh, wisdom. Some, some people have broken wisdom. God will restore that. God will restore your strength, your physical strength. God will restore if you let him. <laughs> number three. Uh, number four, actually. Let's go to number four. So number one, grace seeks people. Number two, grace returns your inheritance. Three, grace requires uh, right self-assessment. And number four, grace seats you at the king's table. I imagine this dirty, homeless guy with broken legs, crippled. They dragged him in, or he's crawling on his hands to the king. And king says, get up. Wash up, and I'm going to put you, and you're going to eat with me. Imagine eating with uh, a president. It'd be kind of cool, okay? But it's nothing. Imagine eating with God. You know that, I know we don't think like that, but someday when I, when I go to the other side, and by faith I will be made righteous and seated in high places. I sometimes dream of eating with Jesus. Imagine sitting at the table with Jesus. I probably would just sit there and shut my mouth and just be like, 
talk to me, Jesus. Say, tell me something. Tell me something else. I, I don't know. I'll be just looking at him, everything that he does. And even more, imagine eating with God. How cool would that be? Here's what I believe. David experienced so much grace. Do you remember the verse he wrote? He has prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies here's what i used to believe that it was david's table and god just filled it up i see it differently now it was god's table and he prepared it and put it in front of david and says eat and when david was filled with all that food or probably spiritual meaning too in it I think at that moment, when David realized how much grace God has shown him, he says, I need to show kindness to somebody else. And here's why I'm trying to convince you, according to the word of God, that God is not mad at you. <laughs> Maybe you said some bad things to God, but God is not mad at you. He's inviting you to the table. Why? Here's why I believe God invites us to the table. Number one, we're made in His image. Number two, if we're believers, we are um, sons and daughters of God. We're princes and we're kings, right? But, but another thing, so we begin to act like God. Ephesians 5.1 says this. Imitate, say it. Who? Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. Here's what I learned about my children. I tell them so much wisdom. I mean, I just tell them, preach so many messages to them. Sometimes before I preach to you, well, a lot of times, they hear it first. When they go to school, I'm preaching to them. I'm telling them stories from the Bible. They know every story from the Bible twice. But I realize they don't do what I teach them. They do what they saw me do. It's more instinctive for our children. Some words that we use, they don't even understand. So you're saying, I can't believe you're acting so arrogantly. Your kid is like, whatever, what is arrogant? And my son will do that to me. What, what is arrogant, Dad? <laughs> but there's another higher level of learning, and that's by instinct. How do lions, baby lions, know how to be adult lions? How do baby leopards know how to? Have you watched Discovery Channel? How do they know how? Do they have some language? Probably not. Do they have some educational system, the Bible? No. They watch by instinct what their parents are doing. Parents, we, if we want our kids to be kind we got to be kind. If we want our kids not to say some bad words, we got to stop saying those bad words because they won't do what you tell them. They will do what they see you do. Here's why God puts you, invites you right to the table. Watch me. Follow me. Here's why God invites you right to the table. He doesn't say you have to jump through so many hoops and so many levels. Right to the table. So you can see what he does. And when you see what he does, you will do what he does. Under grace, you don't read the Bible to find a sin that you're committing. You don't read a Bible and say, oh, I'm doing this wrong and this wrong. Oh, oh more. After every time I read the Bible, Pastor, I feel more condemned. You don't read the Bible for that anymore. You know why we read the Bible? That's how you read the Bible under the law. Under grace, you read the Bible so you can see your father. So you can see the king of the universe. And God trusts his word so much that when you see him, you will act like him. Under grace, the reason you read the Bible is not to see how sinful you are or how sinful your church is member is you read it so you can see who god is and how he behaves how's how he's full of mercy 
so you can show mercy. How he's full of love, unconditional love, love so you can be full of unconditional love. See, Bible says imitate God. How do you imitate him? You got to see him. Where do you see him? In this. So under grace, we look at the Bible differently. We want to see him. We used to sing a song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. Hmm. Hallelujah. God is so confident that when you see him, you will be like him. That's why the world wants to show you another image. So you, it's automatic. It's instinctive. We see, we do. Monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> A child of God sees God, becomes like 